a baseball game this weekend. Every year he goes to a new stadium with his brother. Can you believe it? That's, that's where he is today. Well, a number of years ago, when I was a student down at Trinity Seminary, the president of the school came to speak to the students, and after welcoming us, he began with, I need to confess that I've been involved with three women over the years. He's been having an affair with them. Sarah Lee, Betty Crocker, and Mrs. Fields, <laughs> all of which dealt with pastries, pies, cakes, and cookies. I think many of us can relate to that affair. While that was a humorous incident, referring to adultery, these days it's becoming a big business. In a magazine article I read last year called Cheating Incorporated, it started, the article started like this. Do you want to have an affair? After hearing an ad on Howard Stern's radio show or seeing a commercial on late night TV, you might find yourself on the premier dating website for aspiring adulterers. The article goes on to give one of the taglines on the home page of the site which says this, join free and change your life today, guaranteed. Well, the book of Proverbs would agree with that statement 100%. Regarding adultery, Proverbs 6 says this, sleeping with another man's wife may cost you your very life. Can a man scoop fire into his lap and not be burned? Can he walk on hot coals and not blister his feet? So it is with a man who sleeps with another man's wife. Join free and change your life today, guaranteed? The Bible does agree with that statement. So what do we need to be aware of and do to protect our marriages? What do you need to be aware of and do to protect your marriage? A number of years ago, a friend of mine who was in law enforcement at the time also trained missionaries going overseas on how to keep themselves out of danger in a foreign country. I went with them to one of the trainings, and we were there for two days, and two words continued to stand out to me during that training. Awareness and avoidance. Awareness and avoidance. You need to be aware of your environment and what's going on. You need to be aware of what's going on inside of you. Avoidance. Avoid those places that can put your life in unnecessary risk. Awareness and avoidance. While today's message will be about protecting yourself, protecting your marriage, it is found in the context of adultery. Adultery is sharing with someone emotionally and or sexually, that which is to be reserved for one's spouse. In chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the book of Proverbs, we see an interesting warning from the Father. He does it in a very unique way. In chapter 5, he gives an overview of staying away from adultery. Listen up, don't get caught up, blow up, stock up, grow up, and summing it up. But in chapter 6, what he does this, he just focuses on the first three points. Listen up, caught up, and blow up. And then he gives some examples in there about that. Then he moves on to chapter 7, still listen up, blow up, and caught up. But he tells a story. Listen, I saw a young man standing on a corner. Now, isn't that true of how we do it as parents? We, we have something important we want to tell our kids, and so we try to figure out three or four different ways to illustrate it for them. No, listen, Johnny, Susie, I, I, I saw a, a friend of mine, or your cousin, your cousin, this is what happened to them. As parents, when we, there's something important, we find different ways to illustrate it and to teach it to our kids. And so is the father in Proverbs. These first nine chapters of Proverbs is a dad teaching his son, preparing him with skills for living. So he begins with, listen up. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen carefully to my wise counsel. So now, my son, listen to me. Never stray from about what I, I'm about to say. The son didn't listen, or at least this person didn't. Oh, why didn't I listen to my teachers? Why didn't I pay attention to those who gave me instruction? The father was saying to the son, 
Son, trust my words. You can take them to the bank. Son, listen, stay away from this kind of woman. She'll get you in trouble. Awareness and avoidance. So the father's words challenges his son to avoid putting himself into a situation that will potentially create a temptation to engage intimately with someone other than his wife. Son, it's not worth the risk. You have too much to lose. So he points out to his son how he can get caught up in a situation like this. Verse 3, the lips of an immoral woman are as sweet as honey. Her mouth is smoother than oil. Don't lust for her beauty. Don't let her coyness seduce you. How can a young man get caught up in this? He could be thinking this. I like what she has to say to me. Sounds pretty good. And boy, does she look fine. Mighty fine. His words draw him in, and her beauty he cannot turn away from. He wants her badly. She's seducing him, persuading him that it'll be easy and exciting to have sex together. The principle in, principles in Proverbs are such that wise, as wise readers, we are to take them and to apply them to our current situation. And so we are doing that this morning. How can a how can we get caught up in this today? Well, for a young man, it still is true. Her beauty and her words can draw him into an adulterous affair. But possibly, for most of us, it may not be that obvious. I want to pose a question to you this way. Is it possible that a person could be innocently and ignor ignorantly unaware they are, that they are gradually becoming vulnerable for an affair? What we need is attention and affirmation, admiration, affection, and accommodation. We need that as individuals. You see, when two people sit down over coffee or a meal and intentionally allow the other person to download their thoughts and feelings, a connection is being made. When you allow them uninterrupted time and withhold judgment for the other person struggling to find the words, the relationship is being built and strengthened. He or she may be a neighbor, co-worker, participant in a couple small group, or a fellow volunteer in a ministry at church. There may not even be a physical attraction at first. The critical element in the scenario is not that the person is so appealing to the eye, but that rather he or she is actually interested and who you are, what you're thinking, and what you're feeling. It is said that listening is silent flattery. This person isn't someone that you're going through the daily grind with. You're not spending time dealing with parenting issue, issues, sorting out how to pay bills, sharing chauffeuring the kids' duties, or haggling over those household chores. Even more important, you're not being judged or criticized or interrupted when sharing your innermost thoughts. He or she isn't trying to fix you, but they may even be your greatest cheerleader. All too often, someone outside the marriage with sympathetic ears serves as the sounding board, helping the person find his or her voice. It is then and there that there is the beginning of an emotional intimacy connection. And this type of attention, affirmation, affection, accommodation, and admiration needs to be happening with the spouse, not the neighbor, co-worker, fellow volunteer, or small group member. It has been wired into us that the desire and need to connect with others to experience an intimacy that is way deeper, way deeper than the shallowness that most of us are experiencing in life today. An intimacy that invo involves the emotional, the spiritual, and the physical part of who we are. And when that doesn't happen over time with our spouses, they can begin to feel neglected, unappreciated, 
Add to it the occasional insensitive, thoughtless, and yes, even stupid, and I mean stupid, okay? Word, statement, or action, a wound can develop. Hey, most of us have been there, and they are stupid. Sometimes we realize that too late. Over time, the wound left untreated with an apology and or forgiveness can turn into resentment. We are unaware that we are becoming vulnerable to influences and advances outside the marriage relationship. Festering resentment allowed to grow can lead us to say and to do things that don't even seem like us in retrospect. In the article, Cheating Incorporated, that I referenced earlier, you can go online to the site and register to get to meet those aspiring adulterers. There's a revealing set of statistics in the article when it came to the number of new registrations for the potential affairs. There were spikes in the registrations during four holidays. Spikes. Can you think of what holidays those might be, where those spikes happened? Let's look at the first slide. After New Year's Day. Now you'll see seven bars there, but they're just, it's the days of the week. They're just showing you where the spike is, is the tallest one. All right, some of you thought about the next one, already knew it. Let's show that slide. Yep, Valentine's Day. Makes sense. Yeah. How about the next slide? The day after Mother's Day. Fascinating, isn't it? Big spike and then down low. I think that resentment, that hurt, that wound. Some, some women, it took a couple days to get to that point. Next slide, Father's Day. The four holidays. It reveals that there are times when a husband and wife has over time had enough. And the resentment leads to rationalizing. And then they're pursuing a rendezvous. And the saddest thing with all the good things of the internet these days is that when we are feeling this way, the resentment, the rationalizing, we have too easily the opportunity to quickly move those emotions, that confusion, that hurt, that doubt, that anger into a stupid action. It's really a cry for help. It's really a cry that our, our relationship needs help. But instead, a new registration happens. Dave Carter, a man who has done pastoral counseling for more than 35 years and is an author and speaker on the topic, a few years ago I had the opportunity to sit down with him and explore this topic and his research. And this morning you're going to hear several of his thoughts throughout this message. When we were together, he said this comment that still rings uh, true with me today. He said, the power of a temptation is in the timing. The power of a temptation is in the timing. Now think about it. Yeah, I know there are times that I have to skip lunch or forget it for whatever reason. Then I have to stop home at the grocery store and pick up something for dinner for the family. And I'll tell you, I'm going through that and everything looks good, doesn't it? I'm filling up that cart with stuff I really don't need, okay? I'm hungry. Now, if I go to the grocery store at 7 o'clock at night and I've had a good meal at home, man, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm in and I'm out. I'm in there, conquer. Get those things, get out of there. I want to get home. The power of a temptation is in the timing. So when are there times of high risk in a couple's life? During times of loss, where it could be the death of a family member or significant reversals in areas such as health, career, and finances. Kind of speaks to our culture today. Dave Carter says this about loss. Each spouse can be too overwhelmed to even think of the other. Each is just trying to survive and has very little left over to give to their spouse. Unfo unfaithfulness or even flirtation, though certainly wrong, is understandable when you recall that sex is a great source of comfort, particularly for men. Research has identified that the frequency of sexual relations between a husbands and wives tends to increase after the death of a significant family member. Another high-risk time is life transitions. Major transitions in the life. It could be the addition of one, two, or more children to the family unit. 
could be a major promotion, cross-country moves, a caring for a chronically ill parent, moving into the empty nest season of life, or even retirement. Let's take a moment to talk about the empty nest season of life, where parenting of your kids at home is coming to or has come to an end. When a couple makes parenting the primary task of their marriage relationship, they have a tendency to ignore growing the marriage relationship. Then as the teens or young adults leave home, there is a greater risk of an affair or divorce. The perspective is this. Well, the parenting job is done. There's very little reason for two strangers to stay together. You see, they've become more roommates than soulmates. They may have been great parents, but are disconnected when it comes to their marriage relationship. They've not been growing and nurturing it. Another high-risk time that has been identified is during pregnancy. I mean, let's stop and think about the dynamics there for a moment. Her shape begins to change. Nausea may become an unwelcome guest. Hormones go ballistic. Life can become about the baby, and dad feels neglected. Then imagine when the baby arise, arrives, and the experience of sleep deprivation becomes a normal part of life. My wife and I had four children before our oldest was six years old. Yes, we do know how that happens, okay? <laughs> I remember thinking during that season of life that lack of sleep makes cowards of us all. Lack of sleep makes cowards of us all. I remember waking up in the morning thinking, man, if I could, I'd just drive off to Mexico and just lay on the beach. <laughs> Get some rest. Move away from all the responsibilities for a little bit. I mean, you think and do things that just aren't sane sometimes. All of this can tie into what I call marital drifting. So we have high-risk times of life. Now let's add marital drifting. It can start not long after the wedding day when that personality that once attracted you to one another becomes a growing source of irritation. There's that old saying, Opposites attract, then marry and attack. <laughs> With the addition of a couple kids, or it can start not long after the wedding day. Oh, I already did that part. With the addition of a couple kids, the no longer newlyweds are well on their way to establishing a life that lacks margin and breathing room. After years of pressure with finances or a hectic life schedule, the life can be sucked out of the relationship. You can wonder if, is this what I signed up for? What happened to my life and, and my plans? Is this all there will be? The days of notes and roses and most importantly those I'm all ear conversations are long gone. There's no time or energy for those little acts of kindness and generosity that used to fuel those romantic feelings and actions. Sex that included candles, music, playfulness, and excitement has become a painful source of increasing resentment on both sides of the bed. The temperature of the relationship has shifted away from the warm glow of finding new ways to delight one another to the strong chill of maintaining a mental accounting of every accruing disappointment. There it is. She did it again. I can't believe it. Oh, he knew what he was doing. Or maybe he wasn't doing what he should be doing. And we keep score in our heart. Husband and wife fall into bed each night utterly exhausted. Their conversation limited to details about schedules, finances, problem solving, and the all too often argument of the day. 
So we have high-risk times. We have marital drifting. Now let's add to it high-risk behaviors. High-risk behaviors. Where you are fantasizing about someone other than your spouse. Okay, think of that slide like your mind. What are you putting in your mind other than your spouse? Whose picture would we see there if your mind was on the screen? Or internet searching for old flames. Well, I saw him at the reunion. I just wanted to say, hey, good to see you. Nice catching up. Searching for internet or on the internet for old opposite gender flames is a high risk behavior. Opposite gender friendships at work, neighborhood, church, or the internet. We need to be anchored before the storm hits. When you add high-risk times, high-risk behaviors, and marital drifting together, you've got the perfect storm. And we need to be anchored before the storms come in life. This is just the reality of life. We need to be anchored to God, where we're consistently spending time with Him. You need to be anchored to your spouse, continuing to grow and nurture that marriage relationship. You need to be anchored to some same gender relationships, some individuals that you trust and you can be honest with. You need to be on, uh, anchored to a good church that if you need to, you can sit down with a pastor or counselor to work through some challenges. During high-risk times, you're vulnerable to heading down a path towards a dangerous connection. If you continue on the path, you may be eventually entangled in an affair. And if, some time, if so, at some point, the consequences will come. And even though there may be a thrill at first, there will come a time when you must pay the bill. The father has pleaded with his son, son, listen up, don't get caught up, because if you do, it's going to blow up. And when the blow-up comes, brace yourself for the storm. Proverbs 5, verse 9. Son, if you get caught up, you will lose your honor and hand over to merciless people everything that you have achieved in life. Strangers will obtain your wealth, and someone else will enjoy the fruit of your labor. In the end, you will groan in anguish when disease consumes your body. I have come to the brink of utter ruin. ruin. And now I must face public disgrace. Can a man scoop fire into his lap and not be burned? Can he walk on hot coals and not blister his feet? So it is with the man who sleeps with another man's wife. He who embraces her will not go unpunished. For the man's hus woman's husband will be furious in his jealousy. And he will have no mercy in his day of vengeance. There is no compensation or bribe that will satisfy him. What happens when the affair is exposed? Well, what was done in secret now comes into the light, and you reap the consequences of the choices you've been making. The ripple effect of the choices, it's like taking a big rock and throwing it into the pond. If you were caught in an affair, what relationships would it damage or you would lose? For you, what would it cost? Your wife, your husband, your kids, your extended family, your friends at church, co-workers, neighborhood friends, your health, wealth, reputation, and your legacy, how you will be remembered. Now let me just say here for just a moment, yes, there is forgiveness. If you've been involved in an affair, yes, you can be forgiven by your spouse, certainly by God. You don't have to divorce. You can rebuild your marriage to where it can be stronger than it was before. You just have to identify what created the opportunity, what created the storm to begin with. But that's a different message. With the reality of what was done and what will come, the son remembers what the father said. He said, listen up, don't get caught up, there will be a blow up. My son, if I was you, I would stock up. Stock up on self-discipline. 
Proverbs 5.12. And you will say, how I hated discipline. If only I had not demanded my own way. Oh, why didn't I listen to my teachers? Why didn't I pay attention to those who gave me instruction? Regret is one of the most powerful emotions that there is. Well, what is self-discipline? Self-discipline is making the right choices based on a set of moral beliefs that you have come to hold and not being bumped off course by your temptations. It is having the self-control to set priorities for yourself and to make choices between conflicting desires based on your moral beliefs. So what are your moral beliefs or standards when it comes to relationships with the opposite gender? What is your moral beliefs or standards when it comes to internet usage? Where will you go on the internet? What's allowed? What time will you be on the internet? I mean, really, come on now. Is there any good that happens between midnight and five in the morning? Really? That's just my opinion. It's not a Bible verse. What is your moral beliefs or standards when it comes to your thought life? What you will allow your mind to think on. What you will allow your mind to fantasize about. You see, there's external and internal standards that we need to be developing and have self-discipline with. Joe Frazier, a champion boxer, once said that this way, if you cheated in the dark, you'll be found out under the bright lights of the stadium. Listen up, don't get caught up, my friend. You'll blow up. You should really stock up. But let me give you one more thing. Grow up. Yeah, grow up. Grow up your marriage. Nurture your marriage. Provide what it needs to grow. Pro Proverbs 5.15. Drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. Why spill the water of your springs in public? Having sex with just anyone. Why should you reserve it? You should reserve it for yourselves. Don't share it with strangers. Let, it be, let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving doe, a graceful deer. Let her breast satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, with an immoral woman or embrace the breasts of an adulterous woman? Okay, let's acknowledge the fact that God has wired us with drives and desires biologically, and those are good. They're very good. But God wants us to meet that intimacy, that physical and sexual and emotional intimacy in the confines of the marriage relationship. Nurturing is easy to see these days. What are your plants? If you don't, they wilt and die. What are your marriage? If you don't, it will wilt and die. The heat of life can suck life from it. Remember, if you don't, you may be unaware that you're creating an environment where your spouse is vulnerable or susceptible to outside influences. They may be heading down a path that they're not alert to the dangers ahead. The power of a temptation is in the timing. Awareness, avoidance, grow your marriage. Falling in love requires a pulse, but staying in love requires a plan. Do you have one? Do you have a plan for growing up your marriage? I'd say every year do something to enrich and strengthen your marriage, even if it's as simple as just going to a wedding. Proverbs 5.19 May you always be captivated by her. Why be captivated, my son, with an immoral woman? Be captivated or intoxicated. That's another way you could use that word. Intoxicated with your spouse. Make the focus of your attention your spouse. That idea carries with it that you are going to be consumed by them. You say, well, I, I just don't have those feelings. My friends, it's 
It's motion before emotion. Motion before emotion. You do the right things and trust God that the feelings will come. You see, that takes effort and our need to be intentional and to keep short accounts when it comes to forgiveness. Make a decision to commit to your marriage that you're going to be intentional about growing and protecting it, that you'll become a student of your spouse's needs and seek to willingly meet them, that you'll pray and thank God for your spouse. Proverbs 5, 7. So now, my sons, listen to me. Never stray from what I'm about to say. Run from her. Don't go near her, the door of her house. I want to give you some possible ideas for standards with the opposite sex. And I realize that there's always exception to, uh, to uh, standards. And there's, so don't go to the extreme first and say, well, what about if I'm stranded out there on a, de- on a road? And, you know, don't, don't. Okay, let's, in general, okay? Let's look at this first standard. Don't travel with someone, uh, alone with someone of the opposite sex. Don't eat alone or have coffee with, alone with someone of the opposite sex. Don't confide in or counsel someone of the opposite sex. Don't cultivate online relationships with someone of the opposite sex, particularly old flames. When you feel an attraction toward a specific person, tell someone immediately, and let me add, other than the person you're attracted to, okay? (laughs) Sometimes you do need to state the obvious. Make sure that your spouse knows what your standards are so that he or she can be comfortable with them and hold you accountable to them. Now, the, once again, the reality is that sometimes there may be a unique situation where one of these standards needs to flex. If so, make a decision that you are going to contact your spouse beforehand or as soon as possible to let them know. And if they are com- uncomfortable with it for any reason, just don't do it. Just don't do it. Even with the external standards, the first line of defense is the internal standard of what you let your mind your mind, think about it. Of all the ideas above, the monitoring the mind is really critical. We must win the battle where it starts, and that is in the mind. Now, two phrases we use at home with our boys. I have three, actually not teenage boys now. They've certainly grown into young adults. But bounce the eyes and starve the mind. Bounce the eyes and starve the mind. Bouncing the eyes refers to when you see something inappropriate, that you will look away. It may be on TV, in a magazine, on a computer screen, or phone, or touchpad. It may be the dress of a coworker, friend, or fellow volunteer. Bounce the eyes. Starve the mind is the idea that you will not let inappropriate thoughts start to germinate in your mind so that in your mind you're not comparing the guy or gal from work or your small group to your spouse. Fantasizing about what it would be like to be with them. Starve your mind. Be careful of the novels you read and the pictures that they paint in your mind. They can start those juices flowing, thinking, getting you to think, well, what if that were me in that story? Starve the mind. Bounce the eyes. Starve the mind. Let me encourage you, and then we're going to be wrapping up with these four and then summing it up in a brief conclusion. And let me just let you know we're not singing the last song in case some of you are kind of looking at the clock wondering if we are. We're not singing the last song. Develop intimacy in your marriage four different ways. These four make deposits in your bank. Date times. One speaker said all too often we date to marry but then stop dating. It should be date to marry so we can keep on dating. Pastor and author Dave Carter says this, and this is important, as hopefully most of it has been as important. The one deficit that is universal to marriages experiencing adultery is the loss of fun. The loss of fun. Most couples jo- just stop having fun together. They don't spend money on their marriage. They have stopped building memories between just the two of them. They are consumed with making it through the day to the end of the month, all the while hoping something better will come next year. Something better will come next year. 
But does it? Has it? Start now. Emotional intimacy, heart-to-heart times. Listen without trying to fix your spouse. Listen without trying to fix the problem. Listen without criticism or judgment. Listening is silent flattery. Here's an idea if you're saying, I don't even, emotionally intimate times, I mean, how does that work? Start with a simple question, if you're just wondering. Uh, What has been a high this past week? What has been a low this past week? It's just sitting down and listening. Let them share a high and a low. Just start doing something. Physical intimacy. Date times, emotional intimacy, physical intimacy. A book you may want to consider getting is Sexual Intimacy in Marriage by Dr. William Cutrer. Cutrer. C-U-T-R-E-R. Believe it or not, he's a medical doctor, teaches at a seminary, and even teaches this class at a seminary. Can you believe that? One author writes this. When a man agrees to an exclusive relationship with his wife, he depends on her to meet his sexual need. If she fulfills this need, he finds in her a continuing source of intense pleasure, and his love grows stronger. Date times, emotional intimacy. Whoops, this thing fell off. Is this thing back on? We're close. Sorry. There we go. All right, let's wrap this thing up. Spiritual intimacy. Do you think that you can do all this really without trusting and depending on God? The answer is no. There's a lot here. If you don't pray together with your spouse for your marriage, you can pray on your own for your marriage. You can pray that God would grow your marriage, that God would make it stronger. You can pray that God would heal the wounds in your marriage. You can pray that God would give you a heart of forgiveness. You can pray for your marriage. Continue continue to be surrendering your marriage to God. Asking him to change you first. Change you first. Ask God to give you eyes on how to see what your spouse's needs are. And to give you a heart that would be willing to meet them. That's how you begin to make deposits into that love bank. So summing it up, Proverbs 5. The Lord sees clearly what a man does, everything he, uh, examining every path he takes. An evil man is held captive by his own sins. There are ropes that catch and hold him. He will die from lack of self-control. He will be lost because of his incredible folly. The Lord sees, nothing's hid from his eyes. The lack of self-discipline with your mind is a costly choice. It's hard, but it's a costly choice. Back in the 1990s, Robert Redford starred in the movie Indecent Proposal. The character Redford plays is a billionaire who offers a million dollars to a husband and wife if they agree to allow the wife to commit adultery with him. The couple agree, amazingly, and that decision bankrupt, bankrupted their marriage with confusion, doubt, Insecurity, anger, regret, and the list could go on. I can't even begin to imagine the stupidity, the regret of what went on there. The movie's message, well, I should say they ended up separating and later divorcing. The movie's message to show that in the end it's not worth a million dollars to risk losing the exclusive husband-wife bond. How do we stay faithful to our promise? It starts in our thinking. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, let your mind think on these things. And I end with this statement. The battle to keep your marriage exclusive is won or lost in the mind. In the mind long before it has the chance of proceeding to the bedroom. Will you stand with, for prayer with me? Father God, some sermons are, are certainly delicious, and they're fun, and they're tasty like pizza. Some, marriage, uh, some messages are more uh, nutritious, kind of like broccoli and spinach. 
And Father, I, I thank you for your word that gives us both. And this morning, as we have been challenged by your word, whether married or single, trusting you to be married at some point, God, I pray that you would speak to us and remind us of the truths that we've heard this morning. As a father warns his son, so we have a heavenly father warning us as men and women, as husband and wives, to guard our hearts with diligence. God, I pray for this congregation that you would protect us, that you would give us grace when the unthinkable happens, and forgiveness and the help to rebuild marriages. Father, thank you for your truth and your presence. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a great rest of the day.